So we have been uh, studying for several uh, weeks, months, almost. Is it years now? No, it's not. We have been uh, studying together, though, uh, Bible prophecy for some time. You understand that the Bible is unique in many ways, but one of them is the fact that there is a huge portion of it that is prophecy. There's a reason that prophecy is given. There's several reasons, of course. Number one, you think of prophecy, predictive prophecy, as a, re- as a means to know the future, and that's useful. I'm glad for that. I think that there are ways that we can apply that even to this day that are, are very uh, you know, important that we should know. But one of the most important way, reasons that I believe prophecy is given is because of uh, what we find in John chapter 14 and verse 29, where Jesus simply says, I've told you before it happens so that after it happens, you may believe. Predictive prophecy gives us a firm foundation for our belief. It turns out, though, that not all prophecy is really easy to digest. There is so much difficult things, so many difficult things in prophecy that some people have just decided, let's not look at it anymore. (laughs) It's too difficult. It's too hard. And even if you could understand it, sometimes it says things that are, uh, I don't know a better word than offensive. Have you ever read the Bible and been offended? If you haven't read the Bible and been offended, then I just encourage you to go and read some more. (laughs) It's going to get, eventually it gets us all, right? Because we you know, it cuts like a two-edged sword. So the, the messages that we find in the Bible are not always easy. So then we have to start asking questions of like, what's it in there for then? Like, God, why did you include something so difficult, so, so troubling? Why did you include something that offends like this huge percentage of the population? And you can only believe that the God of the Bible, the one who created all things, the one who loves everybody and gave his son for this entire world gives these messages because of love. Like a warning is given because of love, not only to to give you a firm foundation for your faith, but also so that you will not fall into the deception by which Satan chooses to work. And so today we are talking about how to spot a fake, and you might have guessed from my uh, prequel here, whatever I've given my preamble, that it is not exactly the easiest message in the entire Bible, but it's there for a particular reason. We're going to be studying today Daniel chapter 7, and it has one of the most, I think, important and interesting Bible prophecies. And it's very, I I don't think the interpretation is particularly questionable per se, but some of you who know what's in Daniel 7 are already worried and going, what's what's this going to look like? How's this going to sound? What's coming out in a minute? And so what I want you to do is start thinking about why did God put it in there? If you already know some of the interpretation of Daniel 7, I want you to challenge yourself as you listen to the message and say, well, why is that in there? Why would a God of love put that message in there? I think that you, you probably could come to some good conclusions. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, then now you're really interested because you're like, man, I got to know now what is Daniel 7 all about? And so I want to start by telling you a story about an excellent uh, imposter, a man by the name of Daniel Stein in the 1960s was a, a not known at all artist. He was not very original, but he was very good at what he did. What he did was copy modern artists. And so people like Picasso or Chagall or other people like that, he would copy their paintings and then he would do something that you're not supposed to do. He would sign their name at the bottom of the painting. And then he'd go and tell other people that he was an art dealer and had come across a Picasso. And he could make you a deal. And they would then purchase this seemingly genuine painting. In fact, he was so good at this that Picasso is said to have looked at one of the paintings and said, I think that's mine. (laughs) And then the only reason he was even caught is because Chagall was in a New York art museum at one point, saw this painting and realized that's not mine. There's something off about it. And as he noticed that, he actually told the curator of the museum, you've got a fake on display with my name on it. It was then realized that this man had sold it to them, and he admitted that, yes, he'd been doing this for some time. He spent, pris- he spent time in prison in New York and in France because he had been working through this deceptive way. Now, where did he learn that, those deceptive ways? It's from the original deceiver, friends. 
Satan has been working this way for thousands of years. We are told from the beginning to the end that he is subtle, that he works through deception, and deception is his preferred mode of communication. When Jesus is, is kind of referring to him at one point, he calls him the father of lies because this is just how he works. And so when we find lies or, or, or deception, you, you recognize that this is coming from Satan. He doesn't work through the truth because if he just came out and told you, as Bible-believing Christians, hey, I'm the devil, you should listen to what I say. What are you going to say? You're of course going to say, what? No, I've read all about you. I know what, and so of course not. Get thee behind me, Satan, and you're going to move on. However, if he reveals himself in some sort of uh, other way, maybe through some other person or through some other organization, maybe even through a religious entity, it could be through your pastor. So you always want to pay attention and listen and then be like the Brians and go and check to see if the things that I say are actually true, right? Don't just say, oh, well, Pastor Greg says, don't ever let me catch you saying that, please, please, please. Because even if Pastor Greg says it, you really want to say, well, the word of God says. So that is our in intention today is that we will uh, see what the Word of God says in this most important prophecy in Daniel chapter 7. And so we want to get right into it, and we want to unpack Daniel chapter 7, which says, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. One thing you want to know as we're starting this is this is actually Daniel's first recorded vision in the book of Daniel. Daniel 1 through 6 is all his testimony. There are uh, several other dreams or visions recorded there, but they're not Daniel's. Then you get to Daniel chapter 7, and it's actually Daniel having the dream. Daniel's an important guy, so we want to know what this dream is. And is this a real thing? What are we seeing? Four great beasts came up out of the sea, each different from another. How many of you have ever been out at point no point and just seen beasts like a winged lion or a bear or a four-headed leopard or a terrible beast just come out of the ocean? Have any of you... I have questions if you, if you say yes. Have any of you ever seen that? You've never seen that? So here's a good principle that I think we can take away from this. Number one, when you're reading the Bible, the safest way to read the Bible and to understand and interpret the Bible is to take it as it reads unless there's a clear reason not to, like clear symbolism. Uh, maybe it's, it's some kind of poetry. You need to know what, what kind of of biblical writing you're reading. This is apocalyptic Bible prophecy. It uses symbols to describe things. So when we look at these beasts, you ought to know that Daniel is not seeing an actual four-headed leopard with wings. Right? We need to understand then what are the symbols. Even when we look at the sea, we can find that there are symbols there. So another apocalyptic Bible prophetic book says that the waters could be peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So already we can start to see symbolism is going to be very important. So what are the beasts then might be another question. Well, the great beasts, we're told, are kings that arise out of the earth. And the next verse tells us that even these kings or kingdoms might be that these beasts are representations of powers in the world, right? So this is something that we, we can easily see. We're not, when we look at the animals, these are not actual animals. These are symbolic of kingdoms in the world. And this should not surprise us. In fact, it should start to sound really familiar. Because if you were with us when we studied Daniel chapter 2, the multi-metal man, we saw a succession of four kingdoms, and the fourth kingdom was divided into ten parts. You with me? So let's go ahead and, and unpack and see how many beasts we see and what happens to the fourth one. It says there, the four great beasts came up out of the sea. Each one was different from the other. The first one was like a lion, but it had eagle's wings. And suddenly another beast, the second like a bear, it was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And if I looked and there was another like a leopard, which had its on its back, four wings of a bird. And then I saw another in a night vision, the fourth, the beast, terrible and dreadful, exceedingly strong. And it, he had huge iron teeth. G guys, you're just you're reading this and you're going, this is not literal, right? How many times have you seen an animal with like a grill, right? Young people, you know what I'm talking about at least, right? Okay, this doesn't happen. Animals don't go to the dentist and get, uh, get iron implants. This just doesn't happen. These are symbols. 
But this beast is said to break in pieces and trample the residue of its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it. And it had how many? Ten horns. So we just saw four kingdoms. And then the, the fourth one was broken into ten parts or divided into ten parts. That shows us that God is giving us a, a kind of a, a place to start. So what we find in Bible prophecy is that God often repeats himself so that we can know where we are. We can find our footing. And then he gives us new information because he wants to reveal something else to us. It, you could call it the repeat and enlarge principle. And the idea is, again, that we have a, we have a, a basic place to start, like Daniel 2, general outline. And then as we go through, Daniel 7 repeats it. Daniel 8 repeats it. Daniel 11 and 12 repeat it again. Four times we see the same idea repeated again and again. But each time there's more information. And so as we are, as we're getting into some more specifics, we want to actually remember the vision from Daniel 2 and how this relates to it. So just to the first animal again, it says the first was like a lion. It had eagle's wings. And I watched until its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man. And a man's heart was given to it. Now that ought to sound really familiar to Daniel chapter 4. If you're remembering what happened to Nebuchadnezzar when he was turned into a beast. And then he became a man again. He gave him the heart of a man again. And he basically, like this was a thing that happened in Babylon. Daniel was a part of that. And this representation there was also a lion with wings. You can actually look and go and see the Ishtar gate and find that Babylon had uh, this representation it would have been very familiar to people in Daniel's time. The Bible even describes Babylon like this. Jeremiah, when he's saying Babylon's going to come and destroy Jerusalem, says the lion has come up from his thicket. The destroyer of all nations is on his way. He has gone forth from his place to make your land desolate. This is speaking of Babylon as they are making their march and actually taking over all these different places. Babylon didn't last forever, though. It was supposed to, you remember, the king wrote on all the bricks, Babylon will, you know, stand forever. But it just wasn't so. It turns out that in 539 BC, that the kingdom of Babylon fell. And we know from Daniel 2, that the kingdom that followed was Medo-Persia. Medo-Persia was represented here in Daniel 7 as a bear. This great big bear that was kind of specific. It said it was, we can look there, which raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, oh, sorry, it's take and rise and eat and all that good stuff. I wanted you to see the description. It's uneven. Medo-Persia as a kingdom was uneven. The Persians were stronger. And so it's uneven in its representation in the Bible as well. It also has three ribs in its mouth, which are symbolic. Most theologians agree, though there's maybe not a specific point we could, we could look at in the Bible for that. But most theologians agree that those three ribs identify Lydia, Babylon, and Egypt, the three major powers that it conquered as it became a world empire. But it didn't last forever. This is just review. We're just reviewing here, right? There's another, a third, like a leopard, had on its back four wings of a bird, and the beast also had four heads, and dominion was given unto it. In Daniel 2, the power that followed Medo-Persia is Greece. And Greece was represented, again, you think of how to make a leopard faster. What would you do? You give it wings, right? Um, and so this, this symbol of a very quick conquering kingdom is basically what happened with Alexander the Great for about a decade or more, just a little more than a decade. It took him to conquer all the way from Macedonia down on into India. This is a huge accomplishment. Like, it had taken Medo-Persia a long time to do this. They'd been slow and lumbering, kind of like a bear. And then it turns out that, Medo uh, that Greece just did it qu very quickly. But you remember Alexander the Great died. And then those four kingdoms arise out of that nation. It turns out when he died, he didn't have an heir clearly laid out. And so his generals divided up the kingdom a little bit. And they, they still Greece, but they ruled in different sections. And these four generals... Cassander, Lysimachus, Ptolemy, and Seleucus ended up continuing, but in, not in the strength of Alexander. And, and so it was, historians would uh, record that just a, a short 144 years later, basically as these guys kept at each other all the time, that this empire, which had such promise and hope, ended up falling 
because there was another one on their heels. This is just the succession of kingdoms that we saw in Daniel chapter 2. And so we know that after Greece followed Rome. And Rome is described as being very uh, cruel and crushing and like iron teeth. And it was just kind of a big deal. No empire was quite like it until that point. This terrifying beast, again, is described as having even like iron. You ever seen a beast with iron, uh, iron teeth? I haven't either. But it should clue you in that we're connecting something here because Daniel 2, Rome was iron legs, right? And so all of this so far has been review. And now we're going to get into t- some new information. God has given us a place to start, but he's about to unpack something new. And we want to actually know, well, what is that new thing? He's going to share with you, God's going to share with you through Daniel, and then just secondarily through me. Something that is a little bit difficult sometimes, but then there's good news at the end. So if you can make it through the difficult spot, there's a really good gospel message at the end. Okay, so now we're going to get into what he sees next. This fourth beast, as he's considering the ten horns, then he saw another horn. Well, that's new. We didn't see something else beyond that ten divisions. This little horn came up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And the ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from that kingdom. Continuing there, in this horn, it says there were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words. So, This picture that we're getting here is a picture of these ten horns, which we've already identified previously, we'll identify again as the divided nations of Europe. And the timetable that's given for that is very important. But there is another important kingdom coming up among them. And Daniel's very concerned about this. As Daniel is there, kind of as he's looking at this vision, it says he's grieved in his spirit, and his vision troubled him. So if you're troubled by this vision, you're in good company. Daniel was troubled too. When he saw it, he said, man, this is a problem. And there's a problem because of some of the descriptions about this little horn. It says that this same horn made war against the saints and prevailed against them. He speaks pompous words against the Most High and persecutes the saints of the Most High and shall intend to even change times and laws. Like this is a serious thing. Like, we don't want to just gloss over this. If God is giving us this information, it's got to be for a reason. He then gives us a timetable for how long this power rules for. And it says, the saints shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. We're going to do our best to unpack these things. But look at what Daniel understood about this. He says, my thoughts greatly troubled me, and my countenance changed. But I just kept the matter in my heart. And some of you might be tempted to just keep the matter in your heart. Right? And just not talk about it with anybody. But I want to encourage you that as God gives you opportunity, that you would, in a gentle way, share the Word of God, however you have opportunity. Sometimes the, the messages of God's Word are not easy. Don't start with those necessarily. You notice this is like part number 18 of this series. So if you're like, oh man, that's too much. Go and watch parts 1 through 17, and you'll probably realize that this is leading, right? We got there somehow. So God gives us these messages in prophecy because he loves us. So then we want to actually understand this little horn power a little bit. So we're examining the description from the Bible, and we're actually trying to understand it clearly. So here's what we find in in the description of the little horn, uh, or the the fourth beast at least. Uh, Terrible and dreadful, exceeding strong, had ten horns. These ten kings arise from, its, uh, from this kingdom, and we find that, that the, the ten kingdoms that come out of Rome are uh, things that you would recognize. Kingdoms like the Alamanni. You recognize them, right? Not at all, of course, because they, they became, the name changed to the Germans, right? So the German c- uh, people come from the Alamanni tribe, right? These are the, the ten so-called barbarian tribes that settled in, Euro- in, in Rome after it was divided up. Okay, then you get the Burgundians became the Swiss, the Franks became the French, the Lombards became the Italians, the Saxons became the English, the Suevi became the Portuguese, the Visigoths became the Spanish, and now you counted seven if you are counting. There's supposed to be ten. What happened to the other three? It's a great question. Between the years of 476 and 538, they were basically wiped out at the instigation of a little horn power. And so it's very interesting. We can just look at history and just say, man, 
this is something I want to understand more clearly. These ten horns are, 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 are apparently something that we can just look at in history. Let's just understand this again from Daniel 7, 24. It says, those ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom, and another shall rise after them that shall do, subdue three kings. So our time period. The nations of Europe were basically, uh, s- for the most part, settled around A.D. 476. It was done. Everybody, nobody's moving out anymore. They're all there, right? Ten different powers, which is exactly what we find on the statue in chapter 2. There's ten toes, and then we find ten horns in this terrible beast representing uh, the, the power of Rome in Daniel 7. Ten of them quickly become seven because three of them are uprooted. The first of, the, of those three was uprooted, called the Heruli, when in 493, uh, the help of Emperor Zeno, they were basically wiped out, completely wiped out. They had been living in an area where they were clashing with each one of these powers, basically clashed with the ideas of the little horn power. Then in uh, AD 534, the Vandals had been giving, again, some, uh, some problem there. They had been come up from northern Africa into uh, Italy, and they were wiped out completely. And then 538, we had the Ostrogoths were also down into Italy, causing some serious problems. There had been a decree that had been sent out that said that there was supposed to be a power representing the Roman emperor in the West, but they weren't able to do that because they were being, they were being occupied by the Ostrogoths. And so the, there was a call for help. It came from Emperor Justinian, and the Ostrogoths are no more. This is three out of the ten powers that are no more. Look, if you're just a student of history, and you're reading through Daniel, and you're like, man, there were ten powers, and then three of them got wiped out, and that's exactly what you see when you look at history, that is, I mean, the, the, the thing, way it matches up is just really amazing. So if you were looking back, right, after the fact, this should give you a firm foundation for your faith. So who, who was the one calling for reinforcements? Who was the one that was put in power in that situation? So what we find is that in the early 6th century, 500s, right, that Emperor Justinian moved his, his capital to Constantinople, and that's in Eastern Rome. And so who's going to help in Western Rome? Well, there was one power that had been rising to preeminence quite a bit. There had been five really significant bishops that were helping to rule kind of the church at that time. But it turns out that as time went on, one became more and more important. And that would be the Bishop of Rome that ended up being entrusted with power over Western Rome. So Justinian said, while I'm not in Western Rome, you are going to be the political power in Western Rome. And he gave that power to the Bishop of Rome, which to that point had not been called the the Pope. He'd been called the Bishop of Rome. But around that time period, 5th and 6th centuries, we see this transition where he's taking more political power and actually having more influence. That idea is just history. One thing that we should learn from this that we're going to see throughout is that power is a troubling thing for us human beings. Have any of you ever recognized that when human beings are given power, it is just a dangerous temptation? It is a very difficult thing for any of us. This can, ha- and, and lest you, uh, you know, say, not I, just be careful. Because if you're ever entrusted with power, you're going to need to keep really close to God. Because power corrupts very much. It is just one of those things that seems to happen. And so the more power people have, the more they tend to protect it. And in order to protect it, sometimes they use force. They make bad decisions. The way that you keep yourself out of that temptation is by staying close to Jesus Christ, friends. So if you're ever entrusted with power, like if the nominating committee were to call you and entrust you with power. (laughs) I've been calling a bunch of you guys recently. If the nominating committee calls you and entrusts you with power, you, you start praying because you don't want to become some kind of tyrant in the church, which could happen to anyone. Literally. And so we see that this is something we want to actually be unpacking a little bit more. We want to see if this matches up. History is going to match Daniel 7. So first of all, Daniel 7.24 says that he's different 
from the other ones. The, one of the ways you can see that the, the papal system, and again, I want to be real clear, I'm not going to say anything about a church or about people, because this is not about a church or about people. It's about a system by which man sets up a way that is somehow leaning more on the tradition of man than it is on the word of God. And that's something we want to be very careful about. We always want to actually pay really close attention to the word of God and make that our foundation. And so the way that this, this power, the papal system, was different is it was both a political and a religious power, which is different from any of these other powers after it or before it. He also says he was watching the same horn as making war against the saints and prevailing against them. Unfortunately, this is, um, this is sort of just a, a history lesson today, right? Because the saints were given into the hand of the papal system for over a thousand years this system basically said, if you don't agree with us, if you don't do things the way we say, even though we as a Christian people used to be persecuted and we didn't like that, it turns out that now when you give us power, if you don't agree with us, we then turn into the persecuting power. That's a very tricky thing, friends. And this is where we always want to watch ourselves that we don't turn into that same kind of persecuting power. But if you just look through history, you can find that the uh, Middle Ages, the Dark Ages, whatever you want to call them, this was a troubling history for the, uh, uh, the, the universal church, right? Whatever you want to call uh, that system. This was a, a very difficult time period where sometimes, I mean, depending on the historical estimates, you're looking at tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people that were killed, sometimes in not very pleasant ways, you can go read Fox's Book of Martyrs if you want to have nightmares, because that sort of thing was, again, to protect the power that had been set up. It's something that none of us should ever fall into, but all of us are likely to if we do not stay connected to Jesus Christ. So it also says this in the next verse there, in that 725, it says, they shall think to intend to change times and law. And we know, we studied before, that there is a time where the church, as it were, said, we want to change the solemnity of the, of the seventh-day Sabbath to the first day. And listen, they have no problem saying that out loud. And I'm not even, uh, at least I appreciate their honesty. Because if you read through some of the documentation, the statement is very clear. We have the right to do this because they believe God has entrusted them with the power to make those kinds of decisions. At least that's honest, right? Right? I mean, I've had much harder discussions with some of my, my Protestant friends who don't hold to that idea of tradition, but they try and make some kind of discussion or argument about why to change the, the Sabbath from the seventh day to the first day and try and use biblical ideas. That's much more, you know, you got to use some real gymnastics with that one. At least they're just being very straightforward. And I appreciate that honesty. I honestly do. It says further that the saints will be given into his hand for a time, a times, and half a time. If, uh, again, this is a prophetic time period. It says simply that that is one year, two years, and a half a year. If you take these time period, you'll see that it starts from the end of the, from the, where the, the third power fell, which is 8538, and then you just go forward. You start counting, and you find some very interesting things that happen in the history of the Christian church. At the, in 8538, you see the fall of the Ostrogoths. This is when the uh, emperor's decree that the the papal system would actually have power politically in the west goes into effect before that literally they had no power because the ostrogoths were were occupying parts of italy and even rome at times but then they're they're totally knocked out and they become the power and so for 1260 years guys this is a when you look at what happened when a king would go against the papal system, it was amazing. There are even stories of a, a king who, who decided to defy uh, the, the, the papal system and then was forced in winter to cross the Alps and stand out in a courtyard in the snow for three days making his penance because that was the kind of power that was exerted during that time period. But at the end of that time period, something very interesting happened. You find that the Protestant Reformation is, is really getting full swing in the 1500s, 1600s. A lot is changing all over Europe except in one country. One country that stuck really by the papal system was, was France. 
And it's because some overzealous reformer, and you could do this with this message, by the way. You could be overzealous. You could go and you could today go to your neighbor who is a, a fan of the papal system. And you could say to them, didn't you know that they're the little horn of Bible prophecy, Daniel chapter 7? And they would be like, whoa, whoa, what? <laughs> you want to give me some, some, some other connecting the dots first, please? Right? It would be a lot for somebody to take in all at once. It turns out that in France, somebody did this. They, on the king's bedroom chamber door, posted something that kind of said that very thing. And the king was not very fond of that and came down really hard on the reformers in France. Basically no uh, knocked out the Reformation in France. So that it remained loyal to the papal system the longest. However, when you get to the French Revolution, they completely flip completely to the other side, and they become the world's very first self-proclaimed atheistic nation. They are no longer having anything to do with God, or, or gods for that matter. They, they, I mean, if you read the history of what happened just for those several years, it was really kind of crazy what was going on there. But eventually, Napoleon kind of gets the reins, and he starts doing some conquest throughout all of Europe, trying to make France again a, a great power to unite Europe, to the point that in, in 1798, which is 1260 years after the beginning of that power, actually goes into uh, Italy, and his, one of his generals, General Berthier, basically kidnaps the Pope, takes him back to France, puts him in a dungeon, and he died there. What you call that is a change in political influence. Yes, before... Kings were coming and bowing down before this man. This system held sway and influence over the entire European continent. And then you get people kidnapping the Pope. Like clearly something has changed in that one idea right there. And that is exactly what we find happening in the Bible picture. So let's re recap these just for a moment. The little horn comes up in Western Europe, among the Ten Kingdoms, that had come out of the breakup of Rome. That's exactly what happened with the papal system. It, it, in its rise to power, the little horn uprooted three of the former kingdoms. Because of disagreements, theologically and politically, they actually called for these three kingdoms to be uprooted, and they were uprooted. Number three, the prophecy says that this little horn would come up among the other horns after they were established, which is a time period after AD 476 and before AD 538, when that period actually started, when the last of the three horns was uprooted. He'd be different from the other kingdoms. We saw both political and religious. The little horn would persecute or wear out the saints. We know historically that this is a really a, a kind of a black eye on the papal system, that for over a thousand years, if you disagree with them, it doesn't go well. They seek to change, or think to change at least, times and laws. We see that this is a self-proclaimed idea. Nobody's hiding anything. We're not unearthing some secret backroom deal. This is just something everybody's out in the open with. And then it says simply this time period that is again given that, ba that very much fits history. That's the really hard part. Okay, did you make it through? <sighs> Take a breath for a minute, okay? I if you'd never heard that before, you're going to want to go over that again and make sure that, that what was said is actually accurate, that it matches history, that it matches God's word. But there's good news, because not only was the repetition that, yes, there is a difficult time coming. By the way, God wanted people to know that so that, can you imagine? You look back on Christian history, and the Christians who are faithful to God's word for over a thousand years are persecuted and killed, and we have no explanation, no understanding that God knew this was coming. You got to think at that point, you'd be going, man, I don't know <laughs> I, mean, I don't want to follow God if he doesn't, he lets his pe this happen to his people and he doesn't even know what's going on. But he knew exactly what was going on. And yet, he said, hold on for a little while because there's one more thing I want to reveal to you in Daniel chapter 7. He says, I watched until thrones were put in place and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. And thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were open. Now that is a, a judgment scene if I've ever noticed one. Notice there's a court. The books are open. 
But we've already studied the judgment, so we're not going to go through all of that. If you weren't here for that presentation, guess what I'm going to tell you? It's on YouTube, right? <laughs> go find it. It's on our YouTube page. It's, set, it's, it, it's titled, Who's Afraid of the Judgment? Because the punchline is, if you're connected to Jesus Christ, the judgment holds no fear for you. None whatsoever. That is made clear as we continue. It says, as the court shall be seated, they shall take away his dominion. This is speaking of the little horn power. So it looked like it had so much influence and so much, oh man, what's going to happen? How, that he's killing the saints. But God says, not forever. Not forever. I'm going to take away his dominion, consume and destroy the kingdom. And as I was watching in the night visions, listen to what happens, friends. Daniel beholds one like the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. He, come, he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Friends, where do you know the Son of Man from? Probably you're more familiar with that usage from the New Testament, where you find it 40 different times referring to Jesus. But where did Jesus get the term Son of Man from? Jesus obviously was a student of prophecy. He knew what Daniel 7 said. And so every single thing, so if you're saying, man, why did we spend all that time studying Daniel 7? It's a hard message, it's difficult. Because you're a Bible student like Jesus is. That's why. That's why, friends. We, we want to know just what Jesus knew. And so here he is. He recognized his role. He says, that's me. I'm the son of man. In fact, there were times when he called himself the son of man and people were like, whoa, what? Son of man, who do you think you are? He's like, I... I'm the son of man. What do you mean? I just said it. I, I, I am the, he says other, other places, I'm the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. Like, this is who I am. Guys, that's great news. The only people it's not great news for are the people who are on the other side, but that's not you. You're on this side. One time, though, Judas came to betray him, and you've got to imagine, with those eyes, knowing that these guys all knew Old Testament stuff, when Judas came to betray him with a kiss, he said, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Do you think Judas didn't catch that reference? Son of Man? Where have I, oh, Son of Man sits in judgment in Daniel chapter 7. I just kissed the Son of Man to betray him? Why do you think he was so forlorn and so feeling like, oh man, this is not good <laughs> afterward? Like, friends, the key is that you recognize him as the Son of Man way earlier, <laughs> right? When he says, hey, I'm the Son of Man, behold, I'm coming in the clouds, I'm going to save you. So you say, yes, yes, Jesus, I'm connected to you. You are, you are the Son of Man, I recognize that. Friends, Jesus, as the Son of Man who comes in the judgment, he is said to be our advocate, and he's never lost a case. He's also the judge, and he's in your favor. Guys, nothing to be afraid of there. The, seat, the court was seated. The books were open. But if you're on Jesus' side, there is just nothing to be afraid of. Instead, it says, to then, uh, then to him, Jesus, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. And here's the gospel message, friends. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away. His kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. This is the same picture we saw in Daniel 2. Started in Daniel's time, goes all the way to the, the, the beginning of God's kingdom. And that's the same thing we saw in Daniel 7. Started here, went all the way to the end of the world, except we learned two new things. We learned about this little horn power, and we don't want to be deceived by that. We don't want to believe, by the way, there are many religious systems all around the world that Satan has, has in, instituted some idea that you can save yourself you can work hard. You can obtain forgiveness or, or a favor of God through effort, through your own actions. But guys, you know better. You know that you're saved by grace through faith and not, that, not of works lest any man should boast. You know that. And so you're not going to be caught off guard. Instead, look at what this says. This is amazing, learning about the kingdom. Then the kingdom and dominion shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. Guys, this is amazing. That kingdom is given to Jesus. But then the new information that we get in Daniel 7 is that he turns around and says, all right, where are my saints at? And all of you do one of these, right? Because who are the saints in the Bible? 
The saints are the people who have accepted Jesus Christ in their lives and are part of the family of God. That's who the saints are. And so who gets the kingdom? The saints. Who are the saints? We are. Oh man, can you imagine this message just for a moment here? It's basically saying, look, in this world, you shall have trials and tribulations. But be of good cheer, for I have overcome. Jesus said that. And he said, I'm going to give you the kingdom. Guys, this is such good news. The saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. This is excellent news for us. Jesus is revealed to us as the one who will receive that dominion and power, and yet he says to you and I, just like he said to Adam in the beginning, I want you to have dominion. I'm going to come, come, ye blessed of the Father, come and, and, and become partakers of my kingdom. Guys, this is fantastic news, which means in the meantime, we just don't want to be deceived by anything at all. Where's our safety? How many times have I said that now during this series? Where's our safety? It's right here. And it's in Jesus Christ. And so you want to make sure you're rooted and grounded in God's word and connected to Jesus Christ every day. And the kingdom is yours. If that's your desire, I just want you to just tell Jesus that in your heart right now. We're going to close with a word of prayer and then we're going to sing together. So let's pray. Father in heaven, God, we're so grateful that we can come before you in prayer right now. We recognize that your word gives us clear messages, even if sometimes they are a little bit difficult, but they're very clear. We recognize that, that you've given us prophecy to be a firm foundation for our faith. God, this is, this is just, I mean, it matches so perfectly with history, almost like it's actually a fulfillment of prophecy. Because it is. <laughs> Thank you, God, for giving us that firm foundation for our faith. But also, Lord, we know that you give us these things because you love us and you don't want us to be caught off guard or deceived in any way. Instead, Lord, may we just, may we just run to Jesus. May we, even with this message, go back and check against your word what it says that we may know if these things are so. God, I'm so grateful that you have, you've been merciful to us in giving us your word. And I'm so thankful that you are looking forward to inviting us to be partakers of your kingdom so soon. Thank you, God. We don't deserve it, but we're so grateful. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.